Oops. Oops. <laughs> Hello, Booktube, <laughs> and welcome back to your daily Penguin. This is our tour through my Penguin Classic wall, book by book, author by author, era by era. And for today's Penguin, I want you to do a little thought experiment. I want you to imagine yourself at the monkey house at the zoo. You shouldn't go, because it's a gulag and a slave camp, or even worse, it's an 18th century insane asylum where the populace pays a little money in order to go and gawp at creatures in pain. But let's say hypothetically you went to such an ape house, such a monkey house, and you had a choice between looking at two different gibbon exhibits. One was a normal cage. The gibbon vaulted out of the space be behind from the door to the enclosure and started swinging around on all of the branches and loops and hoops, gibbon style, in a very a great display of acrobatics. And then dropped down to the floor, walked with the gibbon arms over to the door to the, to the recessed back area and went through it and that was that and that was all you saw. So you got the maximum gibbon experience. <laughs> and the other display was more landscaped, it was more leafy. If you go to a zoo, you absolutely shouldn't, but if you do and you see a display like that and you think, well, it's shaped like the animal's natural inhabitant, inha habitation, so it's not quite as cruel, don't deceive yourself. These animals travel enormous distances every day, and they're all as smart as you are. They know perfectly well they're in a cage. It doesn't matter what the curtains look like. But, but let's say you look at that other exhibit, and the gibbon comes out of the recessed area, and maybe it swings around a little, but it also sits and has a little food, and maybe uh, grooms itself a bit, maybe naps, maybe lounges around and just does nothing, kicks back, maybe it occasionally climbs a tree, maybe swings around a little more. The whole thing takes a little longer, and it isn't quite as fireworky. And there will be readers who will prefer that, because they will feel like they have seen more of what a gibbon actually is when it's being a gibbon. And <laughs> that brings us to our Penguin Classic today. We're actually talking about two, and they are abridgments of Edward Gibbon, <laughs> of, of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, which Gibbon started writing in 1776. It was something something in the air in 1776. He started writing it at the same time that Adam Smith came out with Wealth of Nations. And the first volume was a hit. The first volume of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire was a hit for a number of reasons. Uh, the edition sold out like crazy. The, his uh, Gibbon's publisher at the very last minute decided to increase the, the uh, print run, or it would have sold out in an hour. And as it was, it sold out very quickly. Suddenly, Gibbon was the talk of two continents. Uh, for, uh, like I mentioned, a number of different reasons. One of those reasons was his scholarship. No one has ever done this kind of scholarship before on ancient sources. No one's ever done it since. No one's ever likely to. It's frankly superhuman. But another reason, a reason that uh, has been dinged around a few times by my fellow critics, including one with whom I debated the subject, both in print and in private, uh, was the prose. Gibbon's prose is gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Very very Latinate, very Ciceronian, but still gorgeous in a way that, again, very few people have ever equaled or imitated. Uh, and another reason why, another reason why that, uh, that edition sold so well and all other volumes in The Decline of All the Roman Empire sold so well is because Gibbon would often relate extremely racy and scandalous stuff in the footnotes in French. <laughs> and people started wanting, there were volumes, there were, there were uh, informal volumes of Gibbon just the footnotes. <laughs> uh, the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire is a huge sweeping work. By the time Gibbon finally finished it, he wrote it volumes on and off in a number of different places through a number of different crises, both his own and those of his friends. I think that in his working life, it's pretty easy to map, uh, to map events to productivity and conclude that Gibbon wrote best when things were worst. In other words, that he retreated into his writing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that at all. That he retreated into his research and his writing. I wouldn't doubt that at all. Uh, 
But the books kept coming. <laughs> the installments of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire kept coming. Fortunately, uh, Gibbon was able to finish the work before he died. Uh, and his death was, in, in our day, it would have been easily presentable. <laughs> easily he died of the complications of rudimentary surgery that would not have been rudimentary, first of all, and that wouldn't have been postponed as long as it, he had a growth. He had a, he had a growth in his uh, <laughs> in his groin, and it was huge. By the time by the, the time he finally thought it was worth paying attention to, it was enormous. He had to have clothing specially made. People people everywhere he went. He never stopped socializing. He, he always believed, and one of the editors of our volumes today said that he, had, he maintained to the, pretty much the end of his days a happy belief that maybe it wasn't all that noticeable. <laughs> but it was all that noticeable. Absolutely. It was his face, his double chin, his enormous belly, and then another belly sticking out just that far, but where no belly should be. And uh, he died as a result of trying to address that utterly preventable today, one of the many, many things that would have been, uh, author fates that would have been preventable today. Makes you wonder. Makes you wonder if anybody still reads in, 20, in, in 2021 uh, or 2221, will anyone there look back and say, well, gee, this author could have lived a nice right page if only, if only, who knows? I myself don't think reading has that long to live. <laughs> but one way or another, You'll notice, uh, as per my ham-handed introduction, that we have two Penguin classics here. And this is not, you can't tell from the covers, but this is not just Penguin rebranding one thing with a different cover. Uh, the reason why we're talking about an abridged version of the Klein and Fall of the Roman Empire, that's what this is, that's what these both are. They are one volume abridgments of Gibbon, and the reason why we're talking about that is because the, end, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire ended up being absolutely enormous. <laughs> just forbiddingly huge as a work to read. Uh, with many digressions, sometimes chapter long, sometimes three chapter long, digressions of a type very tempting to abridgers. Long digressions on the, the agriculture of one Roman province it looks perfectly ripe for the abridger's knife. Just get rid of it. And Readers of the work also noticed that sometimes when Gibbon was in a perorating mood, when he was angry or when his hackles were up, the prose could be even better. The points could be even better. And also, as, as volume after volume came out, uh, all to less claim than the first one, but that was probably inevitable, uh, readers started to notice that Gibbon also has uneven authorly abilities. They're all great. They're all of a, a very high order, but some are higher than others. He is very, very good at crafting word portraits of people, for instance. And not, may, not really so good at, for instance, even thumbnail sketches of military activity. He was never much for the military. <laughs> never, never much at all. As he was watching, as part, he was part of the British government when he was watching the American Revolution unfold, and then later watching the French Revolution unfold. But you can tell in his books that this is someone who's very comfortable in the drawing room, but isn't really interested in all matters military. Uh, and that also is tempting to the abridger. When an author is, in, is uneven like that, an abridger who's thinking, well, you know, everybody talks about this Gibbon, everybody knows this is a great work of history, but boy, oh boy, there's a market for an abridged version of this. I bet a lot of people would buy an abridged version of this book. Those abridgers for centuries have been absolutely right. Anybody who's ever worked in a used bookstore or, or a retail bookstore, a new bookstore, will tell you that abridged versions of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire always sell better than the whole thing. <laughs> uh, and, of course, that isn't even talking about schools, which is where these Penguin Classics were made. They were made for these schools. And you're not going to ask students, especially undergraduate students, to read The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. You're going to ask them instead to read an abridgment. It's too important for you to skip or at least it was considered so once upon a time. It's not taught in schools anymore, I'd be willing to bet. But uh, it's too important to skip, but there's no way that you can tell a student to read all of it. And a lot of teachers didn't want to do just one passage or two. They want a longer work than that. And hence the market for one volume abridgments of Gibbon. And when you have a market for that sort of thing, you're going to have different approaches. Like we mentioned at the beginning of this video, you're going to have two different Gibbons. 
And those are the two choices that you're going to have. Do you want to look at display number one, where you get Gibbon doing the most stereotypical Gibbon things, and you get the thrill of that and the recognition of that? Or do you want to look at display number two, where you get the whole of what it's like to watch Gibbon a Gibbon at work? <laughs> Which of those two things do you want? I'm, I'm not saying right now when I'm talking to a, a, about an abridged version of a work, I'm not 100% sure that it's wrong to want one or the other. I'm not sure, in other words, that one is superior to the other. But you do have to make a choice if you're going to read an abridgment. Now, keep in mind, Gibbon worked inhumanly hard on this book. And he had, like Plutarch, like Vasari, he had an overarching artistic idea in mind the whole time. It's the height of arrogance, especially modern arrogance, to say otherwise, or to imply that there are parts of his book that obviously don't belong and can obviously be cut. The first person who would have noticed that would have been Edward Gibbon. The first person who would have cared about that would have been Edward Gibbon. So, <laughs> uh, but, but even so, I'm not saying that either of those approaches, if you're going to read an abridged version, then both of those approaches are valid in their own way. But by far, the most popular version of abridging Gibbon in the last 200 years has been the first. I want the swing, I want the high cries, I want the acrobatics, and I don't really want the rest of it. I'm not really interested in the rest of it. I want to see Gibbon at doing quintessentially Gibbon stuff. And that's this. This is from the 1980s. This abridgment is from the 1980s. This is abridged by Dero Saunders, uh, who does a really spirited introduction. This is an old, an old, an older type font. And he admits uh, every abridger of Gibbon has to give you a plan of the book. They have to give some excuse for what they're doing, some rationale. And this this uh, abridger admits at the beginning that uh, most of this volume comes from the first part of Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, with bits and pieces from the, the middle and the end. And the bits and pieces, and even the parts at the beginning, aren't always whole. Like, this, the, uh, Saunders will take... Uh, a long stretch from even the beginning of the book when Gibbon is at his most piquant and will chop it up and and intersperse the bits and pieces with little italics uh, sections of of emendation telling you what's missing how the plot progresses that sort of thing uh, and in therefore by that way this this abridger is giving you the gibboniest bits of Gibbon he's giving you this the the highlights uh, that approach has one main strength and one main main weakness. The main strength is that there was never a dull moment because the editor has gone through and culled all of the dull moments. And the main weakness is that uh, one man's dull moment is another man's uh, thrilling climax. And when you deal with an abridgment like this, you are very much taking handed candy from someone. You're you are very much taking a Gibbon sculpted by one person with a more or less conscious aim of making you the same reader of Gibbon that they were. That's a drawback, especially in a work as big and multifaceted as this. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the only way you're going to do this when somebody does that. When somebody wants to give you... The, Saunders is not the first editor to do this. I'm sure Saunders will not be the last editor to do this. When an editor wants to give you the gibboniest bits, that's what you'll get. You'll get the parts that stand out in their own memory. Uh, and then 20 years later, uh, this version came out. This is by David Wormsley. And he did a scrupulously uh, scholarly fact-checked and annotated, cross-annotated and cross-indexed uh, edition of the whole of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And if you do that, if you're a scholar who does that, I'm telling you, some of Gibbon's resources, some of his citations, oh my, talk about in the weeds. If you're going to devote 10, 20 years of your career to making an edition of the unabridged Gibbon like that, you pretty much get the right to do an abridged version if you want. And uh, that's what Wormsley does in this volume. Only he is the other display case. He is not interested in giving you the Gibboniest bits. Instead, he draws evenly from all three parts of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and he doesn't break up chapters. Doesn't give you fragments. No matter how delicious some of those fragments are, he gives you whole chapters, whole chunks. He, uh, like, like Saunders, he gives you integumentary tissue where he explains the passage of time, 
the passage of events and whatnot. But he, as he says in his introduction, he's not going to do violence to the artistic vision of the whole. So you have two abridged gibbons to choose from. I don't think that Penguin makes this one anymore, but you could easily find it. And most, like I mentioned, most abridged Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire volumes that you can find anywhere by Penguin or anybody else will take this approach. A lot of the first part and bits and pieces of the second and third part, under the assumption that nobody's read that far and that nobody's all that interested, but that they will be interested in the, in the early bits. Uh, you can either do that, and you can find many, many abridged gibbons that do that. Uh, if you're worried, if you're wondering one way or another, and you're buying something sight unseen, try to find the section of the introduction where the author is usually called a note on the text, or a note on methods, or something like that, where the abridger will tell you what they're planning to do. They'll tell you which of those two approaches they plan to take. I think this is the abridged gibbon that Penguin still makes, and uh, if it is, it's understandable, because Penguin Classics paperback also brought out Warmersley's unabridged Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in three fat Penguin Classics, which we will see on this Penguin tour. Um, so they've, they've done both. That, that underscores that this is for... Uh, the Sunshine Patriot, this is for students, this is for dabblers, because you now, with Penguin Classic, and therefore affordable, and there's also a lovely box set, oh my, you actually have the whole of Gibbon in the best scholarly edition it's ever had. So you, this gives you a pressy of that whole work. Wormsley is careful to do that in this volume. He's not just giving you the, the, the racy bits. He's giving you what he would like to call a shorter but accurate, accurately represented version of the longer work that he knows better than anybody. Okay, well, <laughs> you have your choice then. <laughs> you, you have your choice. It'd be one thing if, for instance, you had to go back to 1980 and you had this as an abridged Penguin. And I think Penguin also at the time brought out uh, Gibbon's autobiography, a uh, little book that's actually very interesting. Hang on. Just don't have the air to shout over a siren. Well, so I'll, I'll pause again. Another five minutes is going to be another one. Uh, back in 1980, you didn't have a paperback Penguin Classic abridged, uh, unabridged Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire as an alternative to this. You could still find one. There were there was there was always a couple of unabridged uh, unabridged Gibbons relatively affordable out in the world. Although in 1980, you wouldn't have had the internet to help you look. You would have had to look elsewhere. Catalogs, remember those, <laughs> or used bookstores. Uh, but now you have a choice. If you're not a student, if you're a fan of history, now you have a choice. Uh, because the the third alternative to the example that I gave when I opened this video is available to you. It's just much, much more work. And that is to pack up your house, stop your mail, board your dog, and go and find Gibbons in the wild and hang around them long enough so that they recognize you and they're willing to come out and act around you and you can see them without them and they can see you without them fleeing that is possible and that is the equivalent of reading the unabridged decline and fall of the roman empire it's a it's a big undertaking uh i have done both those things <laughs> i have observed gibbons in the wild and hung around not my intention but hung around long enough so that they got to know me and my dogs and i've also read the whole of the unabridged decline and fall of the roman empire a few times i think it's fantastic Brilliant. I side, of course, with Wormersley. I understand completely the, the value, the, the draw, the attraction of an, an approach like this. Uh, but I don't like how it makes little editors out of all its readers. Every reader who reads the unabridged Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire is going to come out with a different mental list of the, the highlights, the things they want to include in a volume like this. Everybody's going to do that. Uh, whereas I believe, I'd be willing to bet that the variation of Editor of scholarly editions like this is much smaller. If a scholar wants to do a truly representative work, I bet it would look a lot like this. And then there's the whole work, which Penguin also makes, and which you can also read. <laughs> so, so we'll get to that, and, and we'll see what we make of it then. But those, for today, those are your two Penguin classics. Uh, and I, they, I don't uh, out of hand dismiss either one of them. This has its merits. Uh, if you want just the greatest hits of an author who made it a little hard to ferret them out. Uh, but you have a choice to make. If you're going to read an abridged Gibbon, uh, you have a choice to make between these two, these two approaches. That's actually true with pretty much any 
very long canonical work. You're always going to have that choice to make. Uh, so you just have to decide. <laughs> Your Penguin Classic today, uh, in essence, is a recommend. Of course, I recommend Gibbon. <laughs> My uh, critical brethren who have bashed him notwithstanding, of course I recommend him. He is incredible to read. And after that, it's just a call on your part. Do you want to read an abridged? Or do you want to dig into the unabridged? So it's up to you. And if you want to read an abridged, what do you want to do? Which Gibbon enclosure do you want to look at? That's also up to you. So uh, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.